Hello everyone, thank you for coming here and uh, like David I apologize for not talking in your language and I don't know Italian. <laughs> the and problem... But you do know Farsi. I, I know Farsi so I can talk uh, in Farsi. Uh, what I wanted to talk today is about delivering new solutions and new ways of doing things uh, in the aftermath of a disaster especially during the uh, reconstruction phase. Uh, uh, especially from 1990s, uh, we have a global consensus about uh, how to, uh, about reducing disaster risks. Uh, 1990s was the decade for reducing disaster risks. Then it was formalized by uh, the uh, global uh, world uh, UN uh, conference and the outcome was the Hugo framework with uh, a series of recommendations and uh, points and it, uh, those points and recommendations were uh, reaffirmed actually uh, in 2015 in Sendai. And one of the, uh, so the priorities that understanding disaster is strengthening. So there are a number of things, but the, what actually I wanted to talk is about uh, how to increase our resilience, how to uh, prepare for future disasters when something actually happens. So uh, it's, not about, uh, it's not about what uh, we are doing before something else, how can we prepare ourselves so how can we combine whatever we, are, we want to do in an ideal world in a very uncertain situation? So the concept of building back better, which is uh, very famous and very uh, actually advocated in the field of uh, disasters, uh, that global consciousness actually uh, affirmed this. And um, so there are some critics, critical things about this that uh, um, say that it's a global actually agenda. So by having such conferences, such big uh, appealing, you know, all governments agree with doing something, there are some criticism that uh, actually they, they are going to be a global government across internationally, but that is very terrifying, we don't want to talk about that. Uh, by emphasizing on preparing for disasters instead of having reaction to disasters, which was before 1990s, and uh, so the entry point to disasters shift from disaster management to disaster risk reduction. And this uh, shift from disaster management to disaster risk reduction, then it, it built the foundation to reconsolidate everything into resilience afterward. And it became uh, uh, the concept that we have preparations, we have uh, proactive approach, we have reactive approach, and we gather everything in the concept of resilience. But another thing that, was, that is very important was that whatever we are doing for reducing disasters, it has to be mainstream. It has to be part of our everyday life. Otherwise, it, it cannot be a one-off uh, situation or a one-off solution for that. We are trying to prepare ourselves. We are trying to be proactive as all conferences as all actually uh, academics, practitioners now advocate. But an earthquake, a tsunami, uh, these kind of natural hazards, they are not waiting for us to be prepared to, and then they uh, happen. We have now, uh, there are some uh, initiatives, for example, my city is getting, is ready, led by UN, ISDR. And they are working with uh, local government systems, municipalities, things to apply something. Some it is voluntarily. So some cities are part of that. Some cities are not part of that. Different cities are, you know, in different levels of doing things for preparing. But things happen in the middle of things. 
So when something happens, we have two, we have actually two main uh, uh, tasks. One is to address what was the reason for the destruction that we had during, during the disaster. So addressing that, one is that. And another one is that how to mainstream it and how to embed it into our everyday life after, after the uh, reconstruction period finished. So we need to have some uh, short term, actually, solutions, short-term answers, not solutions, short-term uh, activities, and at the same time, we have to be able to link it with the post, actually, reconstruction. So the, uh, so the idea of this improvement and these new answers, new ways of doing things during reconstruction and recovery uh, I cannot see that it's, uh, it's very now established that if, if we don't want to repeat everything, uh, repeat everything that uh, was destructed, was destroyed, and the old mechanism, if we don't want to repeat that, we have to do something new. And uh, there are, again, it seems that when something happens, there is a momentum. Money is coming. And you know, international attention is coming, and suddenly uh, disaster becomes a surgery knife, cuts the uh, cuts the body, and shows what's inside, not only to the local population and the local government, but to the international, actually, international population, and says that oh, these 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 elements in your uh, everyday. Uh, in the context of cities, everyday urban development activities is, is wrong, has failed. People are vulnerable because uh, they are building houses in uh, uh, flat run areas. There are some issues around, uh, uh, around the, your developmental activities. And uh, so it appears that there is a window of opportunity, actually using that momentum, that money, and the, uh, the willingness to show the international community, actually, that we are caring about our people. This is a uh, window of opportunity. But at the same time, there is critic the criticism that, are we taking it too far? Or is it, uh, how uh, can we deliver an ideal situation, actually, in an aftermath? Can we have it, uh, uh, is it idealist or can we, is it uh, realistic? And uh, going back to the idea of uh, delivering improvements during recovery and reconstruction, that a window of opportunity, it appears that there, is, uh, there are some ideas and willingness about improving people's social, social life, in improving financial aspect of uh, the society that uh, the, the disaster affected society. And it's not reconstruction became not, not just you know, building work, became something that can facilitate other kind of activities, other kind of improvements in society. And for example, it uh, it was seen that engaging people in the process of in the process of post disaster reconstruction helps psychological healing, and it uh, and it gives people more the sense of I'm alive and uh, I'm 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 moving on. So the whole the whole. Uh, complexities of uh, post-disaster situation in uh, reconstruction that uh, people are living in uh, temporary, you know, intense, for example, emergency accommodation, transitional shelter, they are waiting for their, uh, they are waiting for their uh, buildings. And uh, there are some questions that do we need to relocate you know, the settlement to another place, there are uh, lots of questions. They are in general, but 
especially in cities, uh, they are more problematic. And now there is a attention, there is a growing attention, like the attention that started from 1990s specifically, uh, to you know, to the importance of being proactive than reactive. Now there is attention to what happens to city, you know, the differences between villages and cities. We have the problem with the uh, actually uh, humanitarian system is is that most experience are in villages, are in rural areas. But now we are seeing more disasters and destructions in uh, urban areas. And the reason might be the rate of urbanization, actually. So we have more cities now. And uh, there is, so logically, we have more, uh, we have more uh, cities. Uh, but the, the issue is that when we have those disasters, uh, is that the landslide, is earthquake, in an urban area, is not only the complexities of you know a disaster that uh, brings in, it adds with the complexities that the city in, in normal situation has. So, for example, regulations. Each city has a municipality with certain regulation which is tougher and more complex than a village. And the bureaucracy in cities are, are more. And uh, so in this situation, the, the question is that when something happened, for example, uh, uh, an earthquake uh, happened, and if we want to have some improvement, some uh, building back better in a, in a city, how far should we go for that improvement in that city? If the city had urban development, you know, what was the mechanisms of governing the city before that disaster? And how that uh, mechanism uh, could be addressed in after the disaster? And especially for the housing reconstruction, when, when something happens, usually the big, uh, big buildings, uh, public buildings, and infrastructure, they are dealt with the big, bigger players, actually. Who takes over the housing reconstruction, which is privately owned by individual families, and uh, how this can be organized? Uh, and when we go back to the need for mainstreaming, for the need for resilience, the long-term, actually, solutions, the long-term improvement. So how can we integrate the whole, uh, the whole new ideas to the new activities that we are going uh, in, to have in our cities? Even in normal situations, if you, if you want to change something in a city, a change a regulation, change uh, a new, introducing new ideas in a city, it's difficult. How it is possible to do that in a very uncertain, very political, very uh, complex situation when a large scale uh, disaster we have? It is all about change. And I'm very, actually, when David was uh, uh, talking, it's all about change, and this change is not something that, and I'm, uh, to be honest, I, I think the, um, I had, uh, David is one of the uh, only people that talks about change. They, are, they talk about improvement, they talk about building back better, they talk about, but actually it's change. And how we deliver this change in a situation that, yes, uh, governments from all around the world, they uh, promise money for reconstruction activities, the humanitarian sense that, you know, it, it's an atmosphere, and many of those promises, they are not delivered. In, in, in most cases, governments, they promise, but they don't give the money. So it's, it's just passing, uh, and it's just empty, actually, promises. Let, let me, in, let me just 
two stories actually. It's not, it's not uh, one case, talking about one case of Mozaffar Abad in Pakistan, the uh, earthquake, uh, that it was uh, uh, mostly rural, uh, destroyed mostly rural areas, but the city of Mozaffar Abad as well. 50% uh, of all building, 12,000 houses. We are talking about not 300 dead, you know, in you know, in the context of Europe, USA. We are talking about international development, which the scale of you know death is much, much more. We are, you know, is thousand. It's, it's beyond the imagination, actually. And. Uh, so, for the case of Mozaffarabad, this rural area, UN habitat took over. The Pakistan didn't have a, an institution to deal with reconstruction activities. So that momentum, that global attention and money and uh, the available uh, help, Let Pakistan to, uh, to establish uh, the institution on reconstruction and dealing with disasters with the help of UN Habitat and directly working on rural areas. But Mozaffarabad, the city actually needed more help and the, the less help that was available because it was more difficult job. And usually these humanitarian organizations and you know, uh, Actually, they didn't uh, fully support it in, in, in terms of project managing, project management, but in, in terms of money, I think they supported. So, for reconstruction of this, the building back better, the idea was, okay, what happened to the uh, city, it shouldn't be repeated again. And again, people should participate. But how do we how do we introduce new things in that city which it didn't have urban development actually uh, mechanisms urban governance mechanism e everything was ad hoc there so the main idea was that uh, so there, there was no urban development plans and that sort of things that we are used to have in uh, in our cities you know maybe it's not. Uh, we are not familiar with that, but there was no urban development plans for that. And there was no institutional experience for that. So it was a perfect opportunity to introduce, to introduce new institutions, to introduce having urban, to having a, a zero point, you know, a point that you have something for your city and you take it from there. But in practice, it takes time. Preparing urban, urban development plan, establishing a new govern, urban governance system in, in a city, it takes time. And it needs uh, capacity, professional capacity, resources. And uh, of course, within that established, uh, new establishment of urban governance system, there had to be regulations for safe construction. Why? Because of, again, disaster risk reduction idea at the beginning. So, we have people, 12,000 buildings actually, uh, houses are in need of reconstruction, at least 12,000 families are in need of housing reconstruction. At the same time, we need to have the urban, new urban governance system introducing that. At the same time, we want to do everything. So, how do we do that? The, what they did, they said that, okay, we are going to, to have a bad development plan, we are going to have, to have uh, new regulations, and all reconstruction activities should follow that regulations. In practice, because of the times, delays, and various complexities, and uh, the, uh, those, the, um, the, t the toughness, actually, of the measures that they introduced. People were waiting, plans were not ready. People were waiting, plans were not ready. And at the end, they, they had to, they, uh, for reassuring that the new buildings, they have the, the, the new buildings, they have this, uh, they comply 
with these new regulations, they had tied the funding system to the progress of building. So people didn't have money, housing, uh, houses could not be ready, and urban development plans were there. To deal with frustrated people, they had to soften their strategies for reconstruction. They had to release money to give people funds to do something for themselves because those urban governance systems could not be in place in time. And what it actually what it led that without when you give money and then when you don't provide fully the, uh, the technical assistance and awareness and you, you don't help people, people started to build informally. <laughs> and actually it created another kind of vulnerability. So it was counter, you know, it, so the way it was framed, the, it, the, the beginning, the desire, the, the uh, approach was good. You know, they, but in practice, what happened? This so many interconnections, interdependencies. They was counterproductive. So the issue, the long-term impact. That is, that was the point. That is the point of mainstreaming. That is the point. That what if it happens again? It was lost because of the, the many practical issues and because of the lack of uh, translating the big ideas into smaller steps. This is one story. Another story is another uh, international case, which I was uh, personally involved in that as well. So here we have uh, 20,000 houses destroyed in a historic, uh, historic city. 80% 80, 80 of, city, actually the city was gone, basically. Just the natural environment we had in the city. The, uh, the context again, the surgery knife, what, why, why, why it happened? Because there was regulation. So there was regulation. So why, why that destruction happened? It was because of the uh, lack of compliance, because the, the, because the failure in urban uh, in municipalities mechanisms that they couldn't actually control and supervise activities. The context was different from Pakistan. There was some experience, post-war reconstruction, for example, that provided some policies for general reconstruction and the importance of people who have participation in it. And the city had kind of established urban governance system in place. So it was not starting from zero. It needed just improvement. So the questions again uh, was that how can, the question is that, how, how can we address those uh, failures in our everyday developmental activities in our city, in, in BAM, during reconstruction? And the question of you know, relocating these, and the, there were lots of questions that managers had to deal with. And one by one, they had to uh, answer this, no, we don't want to relocate the city. Who will uh, reconstruct it is people. Each person has to reconstruct his own house. We provide help. We provide technical assistance. We provide money. But they do this. So this graphic shows some of the actually big questions in that situation. And in this is not uh, a complete actually picture of uh, questions, and each of them actually is a layer of complexities. So in BAM, we had in uh, Pakistan two strategic objectives, engaging people in reconstruction and disaster risk reduction. In BAM, we had three actually strategic objectives. The famous, the, the popular ones, 
you, you always see two objectives in reconstruction and recovery activities, disaster risk reduction and people's participation. Actually, no, at, the, at present, all talk about it. So these are established. But the third one, because of the city that was historic, it was important to preserve, to main, uh, maintain the previous uh, urban identity from architectural and urban, uh, urban design perspective. Uh, so what they did, there, there were uh, established mechanisms. They divided the city to 13 zones. And each 13, each of these zones, kind of a neighborhood, they treated it as a neighborhood. And then they identified what was the problem in our previous uh, housing reconstruction. So one was the lack of sufficient supervision by municipality, by engineers, according to the, you know, to see if, uh, if the structural elements, if the uh, earthquake resistant elements are there. So one was that. And uh, another one was uh, for addressing the historic identity of the city uh, was to introduce a new element in the process of planning permission and, uh, and building regulation on architectural design actually. So you had to follow certain guidance. So they identified two main uh, improvement, possible improvement, uh, and thought, okay, how can we modify the existing system and inject those improvements in that? And I think it was a very creative way of dealing with that large scale. They didn't try to, to start it from scratch but they identified uh, space for maneuver. And each system, I believe that there is a space for, for, for improvement. You can play, play with, uh, uh, with even the most corrupted system, even the most dysfunctional system. There are some space in improvement. And they identified this. So it, it became a modified, potentially improved, urban development system that could be linked to the post-disaster, post-earthquake period. But for dealing with that large scale, the large scale uh, activities, they had to bring so many actors. They had to bring so many, a large number of, for example, consultancy companies for architectural design, engineers, individuals, uh, and uh, uh, local institutions for supervisions and those structural things. And because of people, they had to uh, help people to identify, to decide for themselves which material uh, and uh, what is the best way of uh, rebuilding their houses. So it was, it became a very populated actually program. It became a, a very complex program. F uh, so as they, as they actually had the modified urban housing process, so they kept the design phase and the construction phase as it is in, in all other cities in, in the country. They didn't change it. But they added uh, local consultancies for uh, architectural design, KEO, uh, Kerman Engineering Organization, a local institution, but they had to hire nationally, so uh, a large number of engineers. And of course, reconstruction manager set uh, who actually, they took over the urban, the, the temporary governing in, in, in principle, not on, on paper, uh, took over the city. So the role of municipalities, you know, it became very, very, very uh, subtle and small. 
and the role of setups. And the idea was that after the whole process, setups will uh, give back the whole responsibility, responsibility to municipality. And the construction, uh, and for this construction phase, again, that uh, supervision and uh, new elements injected, were injected to the, uh, to the pro process. So, and the momentum that the whole uh, disaster created, actually, uh, as well as the local influences on the uh, housing uh, reconstruction process, it led to uh, the question of standard, standardization of construction materials. So at national level, there were discussions and there were debates that if we need to do more about standards and about the materials, and then became the pilot projects to, a pilot project to do that. But as you can see, again, there were other elements, there were other elements and other interactions that uh, made even this part of the uh, reconstruction phase more populated and everything, everything was, you know, dependent to everything. And when a system grows, actually, the system itself becomes vulnerable. You know, we are talking about vulnerability of cities, vulnerability of people, vulnerability, but the a system can be vulnerable, the a reconstruction system can be vulnerable. And um, you know, interactions, uh, and then what happens when you don't look, look at the whole system, the system as a whole, there is a good chance to have bottlenecks operational bottlenecks. Again, you have, you know, good intention. You are not starting from scratch, you know, like Pakistan. But because of the lack of strategic thinking, not, not strategic in the sense of, you know, the higher level, but strategic in the sense of purposefulness. And see what, whatever you do, how it how it contributes to achieving your main objectives. And that made the, that made the whole, here there was a big bottleneck. And again, there were delays. Why? Because they wanted to have stronger homes, you know, safe construction, new, new supervision systems, and they brought lots of uh, the local uh, institution and lots of individual engineers from all around the country working with that institution. Yes? And they wanted to, have, uh, to, ap to appreciate the historical continuity of the city. And they introduced measures for that, introducing consultancy companies. But they didn't think that whatever they do is just for one pro product. And the product is one house. And it's like, it's not a rocket science. It's, it's like any other, you know, planning permission and building regulation. At the end of the day, all uh, engineers, architects have to work with each other. But who, who, uh, uh, but which objective is more important than the others, you know? Is it disaster risk reduction? Is it safe construction? Or is it the guidance for the architectural design? It's a very simple question. And this is the strategic approach. When, you are, you are talking about, when we are talking about introducing something, we need to see, OK, what is our priority? If some conflict happened, which happened, a conflict happened. So a big, big uh, exhibitions to how, sh how should buildings should be built, there were big uh, exhibitions, but at the end, all those beautiful architectural urban design projects, you know, on paper exhibition, that's perfect, that was perfect, but it could not be delivered. 
because the uh, engineering uh, supervision and control didn't allow it. Very simple as that. And, and again, delays, delays and delays. And, uh, and at some point, even the, it, it became a national problem and it was debated in parliament. And what happened then, okay, because of the whole, uh, the, this uh, trauma and psychology and the general, uh, the general feeling, uh, the safe construction objective was actually. The priority became that. So the importance of one of the, the last objective was very much, you know, weakened. So by introducing so many things, by asking for so many improvements, you are bringing so many other actors, you are bringing new interactions, new interdependencies, and the importance of organizational structure now. The organizational architecture it, uh, will become very, very important here. So you had to, if they had done this diagram before, they could have seen that, oh, there are something here, maybe we can play with it. You know? like, a, like sketching in architecture, I think. Maybe if we introduce this, if we decide, if we, if we introduce objectives, if it the priorities, with having everyone on board. Not just as a committee, you know, high-level committee, we decide what to do with the city, and then we commission different people to deliver that. If we, if we had that big committee, multidisciplinary committee, each person, each discipline could see the weakness and the strengths of the whole system from the discipline, from their own discipline, and they could reach a mutual understanding is what is the future of this program, not leading to the practice. Because at the end of the day, whatever we are doing in practice, it shows how fluent was the system. So I told about the, the operational bottleneck and they had to change uh, and uh, say that yes, that uh, construction, uh, safe construction is more important and uh, so the longer term impact. So after reconstruction, those new measures for supervision remain in city. So as they promised, as they had promised, they returned the responsibility to municipality and those local institutions are working with municipality now. So in one way, they mainstreamed, you know, they, uh, the, new, in, the new idea, the new measure, and uh, the new way of things uh, stayed. And uh, from my own discipline, it was not, uh, uh, it was on, you could say it was on their achievement, but uh, to some extent, it delivered what, what they wanted at least part of the improvements they wanted, they delivered. And they delivered new standards for construction, uh, for construction materials and things. So let's go, uh, so the, we have these two stories. One in Pakistan, you know, starting from scratch, new ideas, establishing new institutions, uh, bringing people to a level <coughs> that we can present it uh, to international level, and. So the conflict at, for, the, for Pakistan, but at the higher level, the conflict for Iran was at operational level. And my understanding of, if we go back to the idea of change, my understanding of delivering change during uh, a very uncertain, a very political, and a very uh, complex post-disaster with lots of trauma and demanding people is that uh, for, uh, I'm optimist, I'm, I'm a very optimist person. I, I think that we can have change during reconstruction. 
but we need to, we can bring new ideas, we can bring uh, new approaches, but we, we have to see it as a pilot project. We don't need to see it as the absolute, absolute thing. It, can, it needs to be flexible. It needs to be adaptable. We need to play with it as a way that we are treating all other pilot projects and actually experiences. It's a new experience. And it is very much contextual. And as a person that, you know, from that region, I'm very much against the importing this uh, international solutions without any adjustment and without understanding of what's going inside the country. And this is the problem again with the humanitarian system that professionals are, uh, you know, from this country to that country, they deliver a very predefined solutions. They want to deliver those solutions. And then we are talking about contextual. It's about culture. It's about norms, you know, very, very underlying social dynamics that uh, who is respectable person in a neighborhood? You know, that, you know, to whom people are listening? to whom people are respecting, and from that culture to even the professional capaci capacity, are we, the, the, can we deliver what we are promising? How can we engage with that professional capacity inside the country? So the context is not just a number, you know, the number of this, the number of that, how many uh, children do, uh, are, are alive or not, is not that is the very qualitative things that must be considered in whatever new way that uh, we are suggesting. And it should be a strategic, purposeful, and consistent. So if, if we introduce, for example, we bring in 24 consultancy company to a city to help people, and then we put a group of three persons to control their work, obviously, we cannot meet our deadlines. So 24 group should be controlled and approved by a group of three people. So the consistency in every aspect is very important. And sustainability, and this sustainability, I mean uh, if we can have it in place after the short term of reconstruction. No, reconstruction cannot take uh, official, the official reconstruction that money is provided, help is provided, everything is involved in this. It, sh it, it doesn't take 10 years. In, you know, for example, in BAM and Pakistan, it was three years, something like that, three, four years, something like that. So how how the new improvement can be linked. And to me, again, I, I think by engaging the local institutions, by using the opportunity that, you know, the opportunity, that the opportunity in recovery and reconstruction that all people are working with together is a very good vehicle for knowledge transfer, for social learning, and for uh, actually informally empowering local institutions to, to continue their work. So this is my understanding now from today. Maybe tomorrow is something else. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.